President Reagan firmly believed that the government should work for the people, not the other way around. In his 1981 inaugural remarks, he said, Let us take inventory. We are a nation that has a government, not the other way around. And this makes us special among the nations of the earth. Our government has no power except that granted it by the people. It is time to check and reverse the growth of government, which shows signs of having grown beyond the consent of the governed. Thank you for joining us for this week's Throwback Thursday with President Reagan. Join us next week as we share another inspirational quote. And welcome to this month's Live From at the Reagan Library. Remember, we do these on the first Wednesday of every month. Now, this is our first Live From video back on the Reagan Library campus since it closed in March due to the coronavirus pan uh, pandemic, and I am so happy to be here. But although the Reagan Foundation staff is back on campus, the Reagan Library and Museum does still remain closed until further notice. We encourage you to check our website continuously at reaganlibrary.com because as soon as we get a date on when we can reopen, we'll post it right there on our homepage. Now, even though the library and museum has remained closed since March, our Reagan Library Museum store has remained open this entire time thanks to our online retail options. In this Live From video, we're going to take you uh, through a tour of our amazing gift store and hopefully inspire you to purchase something from the safety and comfort of your own home. Now, if you're looking for a gift for yourself or for your loved one, really look no further than our museum store. We have the biggest extensive collection of Ronald Reagan memorabilia available anywhere. And every purchase you make through our store helps us keep Ronald Reagan's memory alive forever through treasured gifts and mementos, especially created because of his significance to an aspect of his life or career. So for example, when Ronald Reagan was in the White House on his Oval Office desk, he kept two plaques that really got to his can-do spirit. Um, one was it can be done, and the other is there's no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. We sell replicas of both of these plaques here in our store, and they're both best sellers. Now, Ronald Reagan loved the great outdoors. He loved visiting his ranch, Rancho del Cielo. He really was a cowboy at heart. So here in our museum store, we have a collection of items that we call Reagan country apparel that really gets at that aspect of his life and career. Um, for example, these leather boots up here, um, with the presidential, the library presidential seal on them are actually inspired by a gift that Ronald Reagan received while in office, although those had the presidential seal on them. These incredible boots are crafted by Texas um, bootmaker Tony Lama. They are made from black ostrich quill and cowhide and have the library presidential seal on the front. Now, please note these are custom made, um, so please give yourself plenty of time for when you actually need them to place your order and then actually receive them in the mail. This classic Western style denim jacket has Ronald Reagan embroidered on the front and this great image of Ronald Reagan on the back from artist Bill Tassetti. Now, if you think of Ronald Reagan and you picture him at the ranch and you picture him on house, uh, horseback, most likely you're actually picturing him wearing a Stetson hat. So of course we sell a collection of those in our store as well. And every Stetson hat we sell um, is stamped with made by Stetson for President Reagan on the inside leather sweatband. Now, if you're looking for the perfect gift for that patriotic someone in your life, um, our cherry wood box 3x5 American flag makes a beautiful and impressive keepsake. Um, every American flag we sell in our store, that flag has actually flown over the Reagan Library here in Simi Valley, California, and every flag we sell comes with a certificate of authenticity that tells you the date the flag actually flew at the library. If you'd like to make this gift even more special, we can customize a video for you that has your loved one's name on it and shows footage of your actual flag flying over the Reagan Library with the date that you request it fly over. Now, if you're looking for the um, perfect gift for the reader in your life, we also have a wide selection of books. Most of our books are from New York Times bestselling authors, and um, many of them are actually even author signed. We also have a limited collection of Ronald Reagan signed and Nancy Reagan signed books. So just ask a store associate how you can add one of these books to your, um, to your priceless collection. 
Now here in the store, people come in our store, they fall in love with our reusable Reagan Library tote bags. Yes, you can buy them here in the store, but they are also free as a gift with purchase every time you spend $75 or more in our store. <clears throat> The American Eagle is a symbol of freedom, of peace, of strength, and our American Eagle statue here is draped in the stars and the stripes, and it's a tribute to President Reagan because it has his motto, Peace Through Strength, on it, and it also has his signature. Now, this gift can also be customizable. Just ask a store associate how you can personalize the plaque. People often ask what some of our best sellers are in here in the store, and some of them include items from our Jelly Belly candy collection. Um, you may recall that in the 1960s, Ronald Reagan was a pipe smoker, and he wanted to give it up, and he traded it for eating jelly beans. The jelly beans soon became Jelly Bellies, um, and in 1980, when Ronald Reagan was elected president, the Jelly Belly candy company created the blue blueberry jelly belly specifically for President Reagan so that they could deliver red, white, and blue jelly bellies to the White House for his 1981 inaugural. Um, the uh, jelly belly candy jars that we sell in our store are representatives of a gift you might have received if you visited the Ronald Reagan White House. Now, our museum store, of course, like all museum stores, also sells apparel, shirts, jackets, um, hats, we have towels, we have socks. Um, and because of the coronavirus pandemic, the way we operate our retail apparel section is different, like uh, across the country. When you are able to visit us here in person, you will find, once you find the item that you're looking for, we only put out on the floor um, one item of each size. Once you find the size you're looking for, tell a store associate, and they will go behind the cash register and get you an individually wrapped clean shirt or jacket or whatever you buy so that you know it's safe and clean. Our museum store is now also selling uh, branded masks and branded hand sanitizers, so you can find that here as well. Now, when the Reagan Library closed in March, we did not stop with any of the construction that we were currently doing before the closure. So when you are able to visit us once we reopen, um, you will find a 100% completely brand new uh, renovated cafe. And with that renovated cafe comes an all new brand new outdoor seating area. So we really look forward to having you come back and visit us, tour through the museum, go into our store, and maybe buy something, and then grab a bite to eat in our brand new cafe and come outside and enjoy your food, enjoying our beautiful vistas, which are a little cloudy today. Um, but we do look forward to having you back. So we want to thank you for joining us today. We hope we inspired you to maybe purchase something. Uh, to find what I talked about today or peruse our hundreds and hundreds of items, simply visit reaganlibrary.com store. Uh, please know that many of the initiatives here at the Reagan Library are actually funded through private donations to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Um, every purchase you make through our store, our website, our catalog helps us fulfill that mission. In short, your purchases help us continue to teach the lessons and legacy of President Reagan, and we really do appreciate your support. We're going to end this podcast as we end all of our podcasts to please remind you, if you haven't already, to subscribe to one of our two audio podcasts, Words to Live By in a Reagan Forum. They can be found on Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, of course, our website, reaganfoundation.org, as well as ricochet.com. I also want to tell you about two video podcasts we have. They're each only a minute long, so they're really easy to digest. They come out every Monday and every Thursday. They're called Monday Minute in the Archives and Thursday Throwback with President Reagan. And you can find them and subscribe to them straight off our YouTube channel at uh, youtube.com slash reaganfoundation. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you next month, maybe right here from the Reagan Library campus. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Your style has been relaxed and full of life. You've given millions of us fond memories, immeasurable joy, and one other thing, Frank, you did it your way. Ronald Reagan and Frank Sinatra's friendship spanned many decades. In fact, Frank Sinatra campaigned for Ronald Reagan in 1980 and also helped orchestrate the 1981 inaugural ball. In 1970, Frank Sinatra gifted this game set to Ronald and Nancy Reagan for Christmas. Games include backgammon, dominoes, scrabble, darts, chess, checkers, and more. 
When we opened the game box, it even still had their most recent scorecard. When Frank Sinatra passed away in 1998, President and Mrs. Reagan issued a statement which said, Today the sound of heaven's chorus is a little brighter and more beautiful as our dear friend Frank Sinatra joins its ranks. Thank you for joining us for this week's Monday Minute in the Archives. Join us next week as we share our next treasure. library like never before. Take a free virtual tour of our entire campus. And don't miss our incredible lineup of virtual speakers broadcast straight to your home. Visit ReaganLibrary.com for details today. Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we bring you New York Stock Exchange Chief Commercial Officer and Vice Chairman John Tuttle. As a member of the New York Stock Exchange Senior Leadership Team, John Tuttle leads the New York Stock Exchange Global Listings, Capital Markets, and Exchange Traded Products businesses. He also manages the exchange relationship with more than 2,200 New York Stock Exchange listed companies and with the investment banking, private equity, venture capital, and legal communities. During a May 26, 2020 interview with KFGO Radio on the reopening of the stock exchange floor, Mr. Tuttle said, The floor represents so much more than the several tens of thousands of square feet it occupies. It's a symbol of America, and it's a symbol of capital markets. It's a symbol of the economy, and after two months of the country and essentially the world being offline, we want to lead from the front. During today's conversation, Mr. Tuttle discusses how the New York Stock Exchange handled the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in March, including temporarily closing the trading floor, as well as the market outlook for the rest of 2020. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program, coming to you from our Air Force One Pavilion Leadership Academy Oval Office, with John Tuttle and Reagan Foundation and Institute Executive Director, John Highbush. Uh, John, uh, thanks so much for joining us on what I'm sure is a typical busy day for you at the New York Stock Exchange. Um, uh, your life has been uh, topsy-turvy, I'm sure, like so many others as a result of the coronavirus and its impact on the markets and, and all that. And I, I wonder, uh, um, in March, um, you all had to shut down floor trading uh, and be all electronic for some time, right? But things are starting to recover and, and life's starting to get back to somewhat of a new normal. Is that right? That's right. And, and first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you, John. And, and I am not uh, at our iconic 11 Wall Street building today where I've spent the past 
13 years of my career, uh, but I'm actually uh, remote like most of our staff right now as, and most of the country as we uh, navigate this pandemic. And I, uh, I I love to see you there in, in what appears to be the Oval Office because I, I certainly am a bit biased in my view, but I think our 11 Wall Street building is one of four buildings that defines America, the White House, the Capitol, the Supreme Court, and the New York Stock Exchange. So it's uh, it's nice to see one of those other four buildings uh, represented, at least in the background. But you're exactly right. You know, we, we've been fortunate to be in this group of organizations that's more than just an organization. It's also a location. So when you think about the White House, that's an organization, but people think of it as a physical location. Same thing with the New York Stock Exchange. And so in 2000, I'm sorry, in, in March of 2020, when the numbers for COVID-19 were looking to spike, the slope of the, uh, the curve was going up. We made the proactive and, and, and thoughtful decision to temporarily close our trading floor. Now, I'll give you some context to that as well and why we did that and why we were comfortable doing that. But we did, uh, we did experience two months uh, of, of operations where we had our trading floor closed. We've since reopened our, our trading floor in a thoughtful and methodical way to ensure you know, safety of all those that uh, would be down there operating. But it was an important milestone because it was the first time that had ever happened in the 228-year history of the New York Stock Exchange. And I think just given your audience and, and, and your, your membership and their respect for the history of our great country, it would be helpful to take a step back and, and just maybe give you know, a bit of those 228 years in, in maybe a minute or two. But the history of the New York Stock Exchange is inextricably intertwined with that of the country. And so probably 99% of the tens of millions of people that would come outside our building each year forget or never knew that the first capital of the United States was not in Washington or Philadelphia, but right there in lower Manhattan. So just across the street from us, where Federal Hall now stands today, was the site of the first capital of the United States. So that's where the State Department was founded, the Treasury Department was founded, Congress and Supreme Court convened for the first time. And that's where George Washington, our first president, was inaugurated. And when, when he was our president and Alexander Hamilton was our first treasury secretary, they came up with this idea of, of, of and created a document called the first report on the public credit. What that did was really lay the groundwork for the capital markets in the United States. And it took all of the state debt following the Revolutionary War, nationalized it, and sold it off in the first tranche of federal government bonds. And we had brokers that operated outside that built you know, our iconic uh, area or corner uh, that would trade these bonds that had been issued by the newly formed government. And one day in 1792, decided to formalize their arrangements, signed a very simple two-paragraph document called the Buttonwood Agreement that gave rise to the New York Stock Exchange. And so we've been, in, we've been our history has been so closely tied uh, with that of the country to our very beginning. And much of that history was really operating as a member-owned organization. And that's what we were for about two centuries. That's who operated in the building there. And that's who really operated uh, our marketplaces. And just like many organizations, more changes happened in the last, let's say, 15 years than the preceding two centuries. And the way we've incorporated technology into our operations, the way we've changed our structure, we're a public company and got it into different asset classes as well, we've really evolved the business. And so by the time we reached March of this year, when the pandemic was really on the upswing, we had done so much work to transform the business and really incorporate industry leading technology into the markets to make sure that not only could we operate the New York Stock Exchange fully remotely, uh, but also that that would have very little impact uh, to the markets. And the investors, whether they be the institutional investors, large pension funds, retirement funds, or even in individual investors that were saving for their 401k or their, their children's you know, college fund, we wanted to make sure we had the infrastructure in place to do that. And so back to, back to March, we made that decision um, to temporarily close the trading floor. We operate 12 exchanges around the world, uh, seven clearinghouses. Most of them operate purely electronically. Uh, but our main market on the NYSE really uh, includes a unique feature uh, to any other marketplace in the world where we bring in human judgment and accountability there to really 
make sure the best outcomes come about for investors and in, in our listed companies. And you know, one time I had uh, a United States senator on the floor. Uh, this is almost a decade ago. Says, why, "Why do you still have a trading floor? You know, you, you could be doing all this electronically, remotely. You know, you could be in your office talking to your customers. You could be outside of Lower Manhattan. Isn't this? And there's a lot of TV down here. Isn't this kind of theater?" And we said. <laughs> Uh, you know, with all due respect, you can make the same argument about the U.S. Senate. You know, you could be back in your home district, you could vote electronically, and you could, uh, some would call that theater. But, um, but for the big decisions, when things matter, moments of crisis, you need the opportunity to bring people together to bring about the best outcomes. And so, unfortunately, during, during a two-month period of time, we had to limit the ability to bring people together. But we still had that infrastructure in place to operate our markets. Um, so what we saw was... Uh, the re- you know, we saw that markets operated very well and very re- in a very resilient way for investors, uh, again, institutional investors and those retail investors, but they weren't as good as if we had that human judgment. So we worked with, we worked with uh, officials in Washington, D.C., with state and local authorities. We retained several uh, public health experts as well, and we put, a plan of, uh, put in place a plan to allow us to thoughtfully and methodically uh, reopen our 11 Wall Street building to some of the traders uh, on our trade book to really bring those benefits back to the marketplace. Yeah, and John, I think I recall when you um, did reopen, uh, the Governor Cuomo was there to ring the bell and you brought back something like a, a fourth of the traders on the floor. Is that still uh, where you're at or have you been able to grow floor activity in terms of human capital um, more so than that? That's a great question. And so, and you're exactly right. So Governor Cuomo was there to commemorate the reopening of the trading floor uh, just after Memorial Day of this year. And from a staff standpoint, we had about 25% in phase one of the of the overall population that would usually be on the trading floor. And that's a mix of uh, brokers who represent uh, buyers and sellers, what are called our market makers who match up buyers and sellers, operations officials, regulatory officials as well. We rolled out phase two just a couple of weeks ago where we were able to bring more personnel back to the floor. Now we're beginning to uh, to plan for phase three. And of course, we're going to monitor events and, and adjust and recalibrate as needed. But our goal and the protections we put in place with our uh, screening and, and requirement of personal protective equipment and testing and all that is really meant to be a risk mitigation uh, effort because you can't fully control COVID. You know, there may be a case at some point. Our goal is to really eliminate uh, the risk of an outbreak and really contain and manage the risk along the way. And you mentioned Governor Cuomo being there to uh, to open the markets. It's always special because, you know, I, I mentioned the four buildings that define America, us being one of them, but it's also one of the few organizations where you have a lot of leaders from the public sector come through there. In my 13 years at the exchange, We've had um, we've had 145 sitting presidents or prime ministers come through the place. It's a very important symbol, not only of our capital markets but of America as well. And I, I, I was so excited to join you today because there's a very special piece of our history, and that's it, with that history so closely intertwined with that of the the country. You know, we the first sitting U.S. president ever to visit the New York was Ronald Reagan, and uh, you know, it's amazing to think because you had so many presidents that traced the roots back to the Northeast, whether it be, you know, Grant or Wilson when he was at Princeton uh, or many others. But really, the first sitting U.S. president ever to visit the New York Stock Exchange was Ronald Reagan. And the only other one was George W. Bush. So it's uh, it's a very special place. And it's always great to have leaders from the public sector there. And it was important to have then there for the reopening as well. Yeah, neat, neat. Uh, that, that, what a, a cool factoid, huh, that Ronald Reagan was the first to visit the floor and uh, typical Reagan, you know, leading as, as he always did. Uh, I, I, You know, John, you talk about um, how the floor, I think, can act as the lifeblood uh, for, you know, such an iconic and important American institution. Interestingly enough, there are so many parallels to the uh, the story you told about the exchange and uh, um, it, to what happens right here at the Reagan Library. We've been closed since the 13th of March. Um, and um, yes, we have about a, a quarter to a half of our staff 
having returned at, uh, to this point, working behind the scenes and the others from home. Uh, but without the museum open, without that interchange, the you know the human activity. Really, it's the lifeblood of places uh, like uh, you at the Exchange or here at the at the Reagan Library. We can operate digitally. That's not a problem, and we do. But to take that element away, it's uh, it's tough, I think. And so we're, we're hoping we get back to whatever the new normal is as soon as possible. I think just like you're preparing for at the Exchange. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's it, it's amazing the transformation that's taken place in the broader marketplace over the past few months. You know, from our standpoint, we were, you know, I mentioned we were a location, just like you know, the you're a location as well that people go to for research for the experience to learn and all that. And you know, if we're gonna try to teach people the important role that markets play in driving economic growth, it's difficult to do that virtually. We can maintain and sustain our operations remotely. Our staff can show up every day and service our clients and customers remotely. But to innovate, to grow, to really you know, advance and move the ball down the field, that comes by bringing people together to share ideas and best practices. And it's been human nature for thousands of years to do that. So do I think we'll go back to the New York Stock Exchange as it was in 2019, at least from how we operate the company? No. Do, are we going to be operating the New York Stock Exchange fully remotely? Absolutely not. But I think us, like you and many other businesses and organizations, will find the opportunity to find this balance around kind of the, the flexible experience or the flexible uh, workday. Yeah, sure, sure. Are, how are things working in, in New York for you, John, from the standpoint of the state's authorities approving uh, you know, greater density uh, out here, for example, at the Reagan Library, we think it's likely going to be, you know, in all probability, Labor Day before the museum is reopened to the public. I wonder, are you able to forecast when you're back to, you know, the intense kind of floor activity that is characteristic of the exchange? Is it the end of the summer or is it just an unknown and you'll know when you know? Yeah, it's it's tough to say, and we're going to continue to monitor events and and obviously continue our communication with uh, public sector leaders and those 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 public health experts that we've engaged with as well to really you know make sure we can operate the New York Stock Exchange and how we how the the, the speed at which we bring the New York Stock Exchange back up to one hundred percent from a personnel and staffing standpoint may differ from that in New York. You know, New York and a lot of the Northeast was really the center of the storm early on in the COVID pandemic. And now we've, we've actually seen that, you know, the trajectory or the, 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 the caseload in, in other parts of the country is spiking more quickly than it has in New York. And hopefully, um, you know, we can continue the, the progress we've made in the Northeast on kind of dampening or, or flattening the curve as well. But, you know, it's, it, it's tough. And, you know, you, you see us, you know, it, there's a lot of questions that are being asked more broadly in New York and, and cities um, about the real, the commercial real estate footprint. Again, many companies have been able to sustain and maintain remotely. And, and in New York City, it's a, it's a unique place because if I step outside of our operations and, and think more broadly to uh, offices in New York City and companies operating in New York City, a lot of their workforce may be commuting in an hour and a half each day. You know, they're in high rise buildings where you're you get into a small elevator and with social distancing, it's very challenging to move the number and volume of people on a given day uh, that, you, that you would. And so what impact does that have on how companies are thinking about their real estate footprint or even how they're allowing their employees to work remotely more? And what are the you know, first, second, third degree effects of that when it comes to what does that do for rents? What does that do for the debt against buildings? Who owns that debt and, and all that? So it's there's really a lot of unknown. I think from, from our standpoint as the exchange, we want to lead from the front. We want to show that you can be responsible in bringing people back. You can be responsible in how you think about your operations because a lot of, the, a lot of businesses and frankly, the world looks to us uh, in this leadership world to see how we do it. And we, you know, we want to show people that you can confidently come back to the office in the right way because, you know, it, it takes no talent to be critical and, and fearful and all that, but, and, and we don't want to be cavalier or pioneers, but we also want to be leaders. And so um, that's what we're going to do. And, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll continue to monitor events and hopefully people will be watching us as we, you know, think about charting our, our course and, and, you know, the, 
returning or moving towards the new normal. You know, uh, John, is it my imagination or um, has the, this period of time during the coronavirus, has it made the markets more fragile in the sense of, I know there's always highs and lows and volatility, but it, uh, it feels or looks like these swings are happening, happening, uh, you know, with greater frequency because of all the uncertainty tied to the virus. Is that dynamic? Is that actually what's occurring? Yeah, I mean, this, certainly the pandemic has had an impact on the market. Early on, it was more fear about the unknown of what is this? What is this virus? Is it coming to the United States? What what effect could it have on global supply chains as companies? you know, a source from Asia and other parts of the world where the pandemic and, and parts of uh, Europe where the pandemic was, or at that time epidemic was, was um, kicking off. And then you saw it carry over and say, okay, well, what effect are these closures and these shelter in place restrictions going to have on certain sectors and in particular, some when you think of collaboration, tech, tech, technology and collaboration tools, they've certainly seen an uptick in users I and mean, video conferencing here is a great example, but you've also seen some sectors, retail, uh, restaurants, energy for, for, for related and different reasons um, that, have, uh, that have been adversely impacted. And that of course impacts the performance of the overall market. But to your point, we've seen a lot of volatility, particularly towards the end of the first quarter and into the second quarter of this year. We saw 5% movements in the market a record number of times. I, this, the, forgive me if I'm off by a number or two, but in the 21 trading days in March, I think the S&P moves more than 5%, 18 of those days. That had only happened three times in history beforehand. So certainly there was an impact on the market. And from our standpoint, yes, the markets had record volatility and near record volumes, but they weren't fragile. The infrastructure was in place to be able to handle this type of uh, market activity. And that's what we were proud of because what we were very focused on is keeping the markets open during this period. There was a lot of calls, both from, from public officials and from folks in the private sector, for us to close the markets, to let them take a breather. We thought that's exactly the wrong thing because that's only going, that, that doesn't make the problem go away. It just, you know, may actually create more fear and more concern and more anxiety uh, among investors. Again, certainly individual investors, and this is what the markets are for. They're for the ability for both investors to access their capital. So if they need cash, they have the ability to you know, sell shares for cash. Or if they see an opportunity uh, that they think is in the market, they can allocate their capital that way. But also the capital markets are the oxygen for, for companies. companies. We wanted to keep the markets open because companies needed access to capital whether it was defensively to shore up their balance sheets to make sure they could weather the storm or opportunistically for those that, you know, saw an opportunity to scale their business more during this time period, provide their services and improve other businesses and lives during this time period, but needed capital to do that. So that's why it's so important um, to keep those markets open. And during that pandemic or during the, the, the two month closure, we helped our listed companies raise over $35 billion that they could use again, defensively, or offensively. Um, and, and we also remained open for companies that were looking for primary equity issues, so IPOs as well. So it's, it's very important. But one thing I will point out, just to tie it back uh, to our great 40th president, was you know, during this time period, you saw something else happen, and, and that was the circuit breakers from the market were triggered. So we have always had single stock, well, over the past let's say decade, we've had single stock circuit breakers, which means if a certain stock moves a certain percentage in a certain amount of time, based on their trading profile, the volume, the price, all that, we halt the stock to say, let, let's let the market collect itself. Let's not have a negative feedback loop kick off here. And let's, let's reopen the stock at the right price. We've always had that. But following, um, following the, some of the market turmoil in the late 1980s, President Reagan's Treasury Secretary towards the tail end of his time as president, Nick Brady, uh, who also carried over into part of George H.W. Bush's administration, had put out, he had a Brady commission, he put out a Brady report, and what they did was they proposed market-wide circuit breakers. So saying, if the markets moved X amount during Y period of time, we'd halt for Z. Uh, and it, it's based, it's calibrated off uh, levels of the S&P. So 
So 7%, 13%, 20%, we, we have different thresholds for how long we halt for. And we hadn't hit those, those, um, uh, those thresholds ever. Um, and we hit them several times. And so we, we got on, we had a surprising and, and exciting and pleasant, very pleasant series of phone calls with uh, Nick Brady, who reached out to us and said, this is exactly why we put this plan in place. It allows uh, the market to take a breather. We're not, you don't want to close the markets. You don't want to increase anxiety uh, or, or exacerbate the problem. But sometimes you need to take a breather or break a negative feedback loop from happening. And so it was the legacy and, and foresight and learnings of, of people from the Reagan administration and, and Nick Brady in particular that really helped us navigate and the markets navigate a very challenging and stressful period. Yeah, and I, and I, in fact, if I recall, it, it had been almost 25 years since uh, the market-wide circuit breaker uh, was put into effect, and it worked, right? It, uh, it, it was this March 9th, it was right around the beginning of the whole COVID thing, right? Absolutely. You mentioned briefly, John, uh, IPOs. I just wondered, how is the pandemic, um, has it just crushed uh, the usual volume that you'd see for IPOs, or is it you know, there's has there been just little impact? Well, uh, short term, yes. Medium term, no. It's a little impact. Um, what's interesting is that if you look back historically, um, th th there's a correlation of negative one between IPO activity and market volatility. Because if you're a company that's thinking about coming to the markets, one of the things you want to do is de-risk as much as possible. And so part of that is if there's market risk out there, uh, you know, that could impact your valuation at the time of your IPO. You want to minimize that as much as possible. So during periods of low volatility for the market, which we saw in, in kind of 2014, 15, 17, 18, and, and parts of 19, um, you saw IPO activity really take on. You saw a very robust IPO pipeline. Uh, of companies from various sectors and frankly various geographies looking to come to the U.S. capital markets to raise capital to kind of grow and expand their business, launch new products, you know, innovations, and along the way, great jobs and improve lives and all that. And we had a very strong pipeline of companies set to come to market in uh, in the first half of this year. Obviously, March happened and volatility spiked to its all-time record, which brought the IPO market to a temporary. Halt. So there was a period of time where we didn't see any new IPOs or very, very few. And when we started to see green shoots come about, meaning when the market started to settle a little bit down, the investors were able to kind of digest what is COVID, what impact near term, medium term could it have, and really just kind of wrap their heads around what was going on, not only in the market, but more broadly in the, you know, across the country and around the world, we started to see the green shoots come up. And that started with what are called SPACs special purpose acquisition companies. It's a, it's a foreign term to many people, but it's really become the story of 2020. What these are are companies or, or yeah, companies that are led by seasoned business executives that go out and are just raising capital. They don't have a business yet. They're a group of people that are raising a, a pool of capital that they're gonna use to buy a private company and take it public. So it's very simple for investors to value that. Your, your value, your kind of, evaluating the, 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 the credentials and credibility of the management team. And, you know, it's a pool of cash. So that's pretty easy to know. So you started to see SPACs come to market. In fact, in the first half of this year, SPACs accounted for about 40% of the overall market and are really um, kind of continuing on that trajectory. And, and, and we have a number of very large ones listing in the near future. Then you started to see healthcare companies and biotech companies emerge because not only was a lot of investors focused towards um, healthcare and biotech you know, to help solve a pandemic and, and some of the challenges we have, but also the profile of those companies and the way they consume capital is a bit unique. You know, there, there's heavy investments on the front end on research and development. And so they're, they're heavy consumers of capital and the business profile is a little bit different. Many of them are pre-revenue even. They, so they're not as impacted by the events uh, of COVID and the impact of COVID. And then we started to see companies come back more and more that had, or come to market that had uh, predictable uh, businesses. So predictable revenue streams and growth. So 
think subscription-based businesses like enterprise software companies where you buy licenses and you renew those annually. And, and they're pretty, pretty easy or, or more predictable for investors to value the company and, and, see, how it, and uh, see how it's going to grow. And with the success and overwhelming, frankly, market response to those IPOs, you started to see the, the, the IPO window open to other um, sectors. So consumer tech companies, uh, fintech companies are coming to market. And you're even starting to see some of the most challenging industries uh, come to market, resource companies as well. So think energy, oil and gas. There's, there's, there's renewed interest in, in coming to the, to the public markets to raise capital. So while short term, yes, the IPO market ground to a complete stop, it uh, came back to life. And frankly, uh, more quickly than I had thought it would as well. So that's that's part of why we kept the markets open to make sure that companies know they could come to, to the markets and the investors you know, gave them a warm response. And so perhaps because we kept uh, the capital markets open, we've actually helped aid at least part of this recovery um, and, and expedite it, at least from an economic standpoint. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll pick up on your phrase uh, more quickly than... Uh, I would have expected or uh, on the stock market front, I, I thought that uh, President Trump was, you know, as he often does, uh, you know, out there from a promotion standpoint, uh, predicting a V-shaped uh, rebound in the markets um, as we started to climb out of the pandemic situation. And I thought to myself, V-shape, come on, you know, this economy's in great trouble we're not likely to see that yet. Here we are, <laughs> with the V-shaped recovery in the markets, at least to this present day. Is that did that surprise you, or no? You you felt just like the president. We were going to see tremendous return of the market uh, as we started to, you know, uh, co you know, come come back together economically. Yeah, well, good question. We still certainly have a long way to go. I mean, in short term, it's been. Uh, a, a quick recovery, at least when you look at market and the market performance. Uh, and it's the recovery, frankly, I think all of us had hoped for. None of us wanted to see a prolonged recovery or kind of the L-shaped or U-shaped or all, all the different letters that were thrown out there, or the Nike swoosh recovery as well, so that we could get back to life as normal or whatever the new normal would be, uh, we wanted to. So I think a lot of folks are, are surprised, if not pleased at the, the near-term performance, but there's still a lot of unknowns. And I don't mean that in any kind of way to scare people or anything like that, but investors are looking to see how did companies weather the second quarter? You know, what was the impact? What is management's projection of how their business is going to perform in the second half of the year and into 2021? And a lot of those earnings are going to be coming out early next, you know, late this month, early next month. So hopefully there, there's still that optimism from investors. Um, Hopefully, you know, companies will be able to clearly articulate uh, their, their, their path back to or towards the new normal, and hopefully this is sustainable. But again, it, it remains to be seen. One of the interesting things, though, that I'll point out that we saw, and, and I don't necessarily want to say it was the driver of this recovery by any means, but an interesting observation that we had was that the... Over the past two decades, the number of individuals holding stock in the United States continued to decline. And there was a lot of reasons for that. Primarily the rise of passive investing in things like ETFs, where you're buying an instrument that's a basket of stocks or investing in other asset classes. What we've seen is a total resurgence in retail uh, participation in the market. So single stock purchasing or single company stock purchasing. And some of it is from investors who said, hey, I've looked at this company, I know this company, and I know that it's undervalued right now, and I want to allocate my capital this way. I have a belief of that. But a really interesting uh, and kind of um, uh, something you wouldn't have thought of uh, observation came up or counterintuitive observation came up. And that was that a lot of day traders came back into the market, the folks that were more betting and gambling than investing. And a lot of that was- Is this the, or the 
Is this the Robin Hood? Uh, I was about to ask you exactly this point, John. Is the Robin Hood effect? Is that what's is some of that? What's happening here? I think part of it is is that so retail brokerage. So whether it be Robin Hood, Charles mm-hmm. Schwab, and others, you know, the you used to pay fifteen years ago twenty nine dollars to trade. You know, a commission. Now it's effectively free to trade, zero commission. So it removes a lot of that friction for retail investors to move in and out of the markets. And so a lot of you know, um, with sports being shut down, so all of your leagues being closed down, casinos being closed down, other things. A lot of these folks that kind of um, got their highs from from uh, from operating in those markets or 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 playing came over and saw an opportunity to you know, hey, this is something to <laughs> occupy me or entertain me that I can move in and out of. But what we've, we've seen is a lot of retail investors return to market now. Hopefully. In the medium to long term, a lot of those are individuals who are who are learning more about the markets, understanding the markets, having a view on companies, and really investing for the long term and for their own personal future. But it is interesting to see this, the overall spike in retail returning to the market and individual stock ownership during this time period. Yeah, so I was going to, with respect to that, John, um, as the stimulus checks uh, run their course, as there's less cash, you know, whether it comes from, you know, the higher amounts of money you can get for unemployment, et cetera. When that, when those funds start to peter out, um, do you think in all likelihood we're going to see a a pullback from so much of this day trading and uh, I won't call it gambling, but, you know, there'll just be less cash for people to be able to uh, consider as discretionary to throw against uh, the trading day to day? Well, I, I hope there's additional places to, uh, uh, to, 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 to to spend their time as well. So I hope that sports will be back. I hope that entertainment will be back. Restaurants will be back. A lot of that will be driven by a vaccine. So hopefully by the time, to your point, you know, these programs come to, an, you know, uh, are, are sunsetted, uh, that also coincides with a time when we have a vaccine and we can begin to return to uh, life as normal, bringing people together, going out and enjoying our communities, and making sure that the economic recovery is is long term and sustainable. So uh, I'm optimistic that we we will see a downtick in that, but that also means that we're going to see an uptick in broader activity in the marketplace, which is good for everybody, and, and it's that rising tide that will lift all boats. Sure, sure. Uh, John, do you think? Uh, well, let me ask you. I bet you you know your history on this. Is there routinely a l- more volatility as uh, the nation approaches the presidential election cycle every four years? It, the, the uncertainty that a potential change in office uh, could bring, or no, it's pretty straight even, uh, you know, don't pull in or get back or in the market uh, just because it happens to be election year. Um, do you see any of that going on? You know, historically there has been, and and. To, to some of it, it had been driven by, um, you know, the the the, the candidates' uh, policies or or perceived policies by investors. But some of it is also just kind of a self fulfilling prophecy. And what I mean is that um, when you think of IPOs, I talked about de risking as much as possible. And so there's a view that there could be some you know political risk around the time of the election that could. Uh, turn into market risk. So let's steer away from that time period. So that risk may not have actually been there, but the perception that there, that it could have been there has caused people to, to shift timing when it comes to when they come to market. Uh, what's fascinating, though, is over time, you see a coupling and decoupling of market uh, activity and kind of geopolitical or macroeconomic activity. What I mean by that is that Sometimes during election cycles, investors will take what had been, you know, would have taken statements and information uh, and, and, and views by candidates and, and overweighted them on the impact it would have on the market. And other times, they kind of write it off as, as less impactful. And what I mean by that is, you know, I, 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 I half joke, but if five years ago, uh, you know, a canoe sprung a leak in the Niger River Delta, oil would spike 10%. But then all of a sudden you get into the, you know, the 2016 presidential election, you have all kinds of rhetoric that's happening. And you also on top of that have North Korea, you know, sending missiles over Japan, all these other events, and the market just keeps on going up. 
So there's times when the investors are really going to be honed in on that um, geopolitical macroeconomic activity and, 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 and kind of overweighting it or over-indexing it, market impact. And you're going to see times when they dial it back where you say, okay, there is a lot of he said, she said in the 2016 election. Let's wait to see what happens after the election. And that's when we're going to have a better sense of certainty about the political and regulatory outlook. And we'll, we'll make our adjustments at that time. So yes, there is impact, um, but it depends from time to time over history how much investors are calibrating or dialing that in or, or dialing it back. Um, you know, something that's fascinated me having worked in Washington for many years is, as you did, is it's not often the case that, that a sitting president uh, will tie their future uh, to the market. Um, the market can go up and down, and oftentimes politicians don't want to hitch their wagon to something they certainly can't uh, fully control, and the New York Stock Exchange would be one of them. Uh, but President Trump, as I'm sure you have watched on any given day, will um, you know, claim credit for the, the rising market and uh, people's value for their 401k and the rest of that. I just, I wonder if you, as you watch that, you, you find that unusual that, a, that a, a, whether it's Trump or any sitting president would hitch themselves to the exchange uh, as he's done. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, um, it's interesting to watch. And I think the stock market performance is one of the ways you can keep score of your progress in implementing, you know, and the impact of economic uh, reforms. And so, you know, President Trump has a, has a business background. He's seen the market performance, uh, um, you know, be strong during most of his presidency. And so that number plus jobs numbers and others are the way he keeps score and he wants America to keep score of how successful he is as a president. You know, other presidents may have, you know, prioritized different areas, foreign policy over the economy and others, but, but certainly with this president, um, economic performance, job growth, uh, it, it is how he's going to measure uh, success. What's really interesting though, is I mentioned kind of the, the, the political rhetoric and, and how the market in the 2016 election kind of decoupled from that. Well. What was fascinating was that even the night of the election, when at eight o'clock at night, I, you know, I, I like you and, and you know, like to study politics and, and, and have a consumer of this information and experience and, 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 and you know, love our democracy. And I'm watching the election results come in. And even at eight, nine o'clock at night on my iPad next to my TV, I'm seeing, you know, Clinton versus Trump, 90% collective chance. And it, it dwindled down and down and down and down. And at the same time, you saw the market futures go down and down and down and down. And so it looked like the Dow was going to open down 5%. So at, at two in the morning, I draft a email going out to all 2,200 of our listed companies, 46 countries around the world saying, hey, here's the market-wide circuit breakers that we talked about earlier. You know, this is what it means you know, and, and I, I sent it off to our, our legal team to review it. And I got ready to, you know, send it out first thing in the morning. Got a couple of hours of sleep. I walked to the office. The Dow futures are only down 100 points. I, I go down for the opening bell ceremony. And leading up to the bell, you know, the, the futures are climbing up. The market opened up 150 points. I think it closed up that day, 300 points. Never looked back. And what it told me was that, you know, while during the election, uh, people focus on a lot of the negative things. Um, the, the uh, said during the presidential campaign, immediately after they had a sense of certainty and were able to digest the results, they started focusing on the positive things for the economy. And that's tax reform, which we saw, um, regulatory review and reform in many, many areas. And that had a gave a strong kind of boost to the market and kicked off a lot of um, uh, opportunities for companies. They had strong performance, strong earnings growth. That gave a tailwind to the market and, and really took off. So it, it is interesting during election year to see how investors will observe it and it, observe kind of candidates and the rhetoric and the campaigns in the period of election, election night and then kind of day after election and what it looks like going forward. Yeah, can you, I spoke about Trump and when he oft times asked the question, how's your 401k? When I've seen him do that, I thought, okay, well, this is a clever 
uh, way of taking some credit for the uh, uh, rising economy, at least pre-COVID-19. Um, but then, you know, I did a little digging and um, saw that I think you've got a better handle on these numbers, but roughly half of them, all of Americans um, have stock of, you know, that they might trade on any given day. Uh, the other half don't, uh, so the how's your 401k, it's not likely resonating with, with those folks. And, you know, it seems like um, we may have as much as half the country participating, but the vast majority of stock ownership is, it's not the top 1%, but it's roughly the top 10% of Americans what does that tell you about participation in the market in America today? When, I mean, I'm sure you'd love to see every American, um, you know, with some uh, investment in the market, but it, it, it seems like half of half this nation doesn't participate in, in uh, this, you know, this great enterprise that you, you, you sit on top of. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and it, you know, I think it starts with financial literacy and opportunity and, First, educating people at a very young age, you know, how business works, how the market works, how, how you can manage your finances, how you can allocate your capital and make those decisions. The second is giving people the opportunity to make those um, investment choices. And again, some, some sectors, some, some parts of the economy, some uh, kind of socioeconomic uh, groups uh, don't necessarily have as much opportunity. And, and that's why educating them and, and about financial literacy, but also arming them with the tools that we talked about earlier, the ability to come in and out of the market at much lower friction, the ability, you know, with less commissions, you know, the ability to buy fractional shares of stock, which maybe you can't buy a thousand dollar share or like a huge share of Berkshire Hathaway in the multi hundreds of thousands of dollars, but maybe you can buy a fraction of it and be part of that because the markets, um, the markets have created so much wealth generation for so allowed us to increase our quality of living in this country, been able to export that quality of life to other parts of the world as well. And so we, making sure that that opportunity is available to the masses is incredibly important to us and not just the few that means. And that's why we, we believe it's so important and, and, and we're going out and teaching it on the road. Our first stop is Detroit, uh, uh, my, my native Detroit in a, in a couple of weeks here to really teach the power of entrepreneurship, the power of the markets, because if we teach people the important role that markets play in driving economic growth, they can understand it, they can participate in it as well. And that can really help improve lives and provide opportunity to folks that wouldn't have access um, uh, to the opportunities they would if they were able to participate in the market. So yes, I, I agree, there's too much of our country that is, is kind of left out of the markets. Um, you know, some with means have benefited more than others that haven't had the opportunity I mean, so it's incredibly important to give that opportunity, that access, and that education and those tools to, to many, to, to kind of everybody in this country, and frankly, eventually, hopefully around the world. Sure. A, a few more questions, if, if you've got a few more minutes, John. Um, uh, how would you grade um, the Treasury and the Fed uh, in terms of their response to the pandemic? I mean, from looking back, from as I look at it, I would give them an A in the sense that so much of our nation was concerned. We were heading into a depression. I mean, certainly you'd believe that if you'd watched the media at the time. Yet um, they seem to me to have stayed on top of this stimulus you know, was such, so aggressively that, you know, we're not nearly as in rough a shape as we could have been. So I wonder if you look at it from the exchange standpoint, how would you grade uh, Treasury and the Fed in the, in the last three, four months? It's a great question. I think to this point, I too would give them an A. And again, that's my personal view, but um, several things. One is that uh, I've had a lot of discussions and participated in a lot of discussions with senior members of government. So particularly on Capitol Hill, senior members of the Senate from both sides. And the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive about the performance of both Secretary Mnuchin and, uh, and, and Fed Chairman Powell. And that's, again, from both sides of the aisle. So this is, they, they found a way to get bipartisan support for what they're doing. I think also attacking this problem 
of the potential problem head on. And I don't want to say with overwhelming force, but with a lot of force when it comes to market powers and levers and, and tools you can provide from a fiscal and monetary standpoint uh, to just is going to really help soften the impact uh, that that the pandemic would have on the overall economy and hopefully speed up the recovery. And the way I was describing it to somebody the other day is like, look, nobody wants to issue lots of debt. Nobody wants to put ourselves in in a fiscally unsustainable scenario. But this isn't the choice between living kind of a happy, you know, ignoring the problem and, and living a happy life or, or doing this. This is almost, for lack of a better way to describe it, chemotherapy. It does terrible things to the body, can really impact you. And at the end of it, you know, you're, you, you'll, you'll beat the problem, you'll be in a better place, you'll live the rest of your life, you, 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 you learn a lot along the way and, and you recover. Because if you don't do it, the, the alternative is, is much, much worse. So that's how I view a lot of these efforts. I don't think anybody wants to you know, add trillions to our debt. I don't think anybody wants to increase um, unemployment rolls or, or, or allow this to continue as long as possible. But we're going to do what's necessary. And, and, and I'm pleased to see policymakers doing what's necessary to, to give us the optimal outcome given the circumstances. Yeah, well, we'd live to fight another day, right? But um, as you said, John, the a couple of trillion bucks, um, it's a whole lot of money. I, I wonder, you know, if this were the Reagan years and some years after that, that, that everyone would be concerned about the crowding out effect and, you know, and adding more to this debt. And, is, you know, in, in your mind, is there going to be a day of reckoning um, uh, and it, and is it near term or long term? I, I just wonder to what extent this eventually affects interest rates and inflation and all those ugly things that uh, you know Reaganomics had to fight fight an uphill battle against. Yeah, yeah. So at least in the short term, it seems that you know the what we're doing is is sustainable. In the longer term, is you know obviously unknown, but the laws of economics will certainly come into play at at some point. Uh, and, and, and gravity will return at some point. But um, I, I think this is an opportunity for brave policymakers, the, the folks that really went to Washington, went to their state capitals, went to their, you know, went to their city halls to make a difference, to step forward and say, you know what, we will need to make tough decisions. Like debt to GDP ratios, when you think about it on a relative basis, people say, oh, we're not, we're not bad compared to the developed world. In fact, we're, we're better than most G7 countries. But, but when you think about it as an absolute amount of money and tens of trillions of dollars of debt, that's, that's challenging. So we need to make sure we're, we're doing the right decisions now. And, and again, I understand we're adding to that because we, we want to live to fight another day. But we need to make sure, at least in the right now in the medium term, that we're we're willing, you know, we're willing to make sacrifices now, but we're we have to we have to make the changes necessary um, you know, on an ongoing basis to make sure our economy and our capital markets. Uh, continue to be the envy of the world. And we don't just continue to kick the can over and over and over. We need brave political leaders like President Reagan and others to step up and make reforms that are necessary to say, hey, just because we've done things one way for 40 years doesn't mean we need to do them the next way for 40 years. Like any good business, any good policymaker should look back and say, what works, what doesn't work, what do we need to do to prepare ourselves or in this case, our country for the future? And make and be willing to be brave enough to make those changes, uh, and 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 propose that legislation and, put, and advance those issues. John, if I could, last question. It's one more on a personal nature or um, advice for uh, for young people coming out of college. You know, you have such a unique and distinguished career, and you're still young. And but you you chose to serve both in. The, private sector and the public sector. You worked at the White House, uh, some big jobs. And uh, so you've had a lot of opportunity. I wonder what would your advice be for um, st you know, students graduating um, from college? What's the secret to success? Uh, whether you decide to uh, make your path uh, the public or the the private road, or do you think a, a lifetime is, you know, really is uh, enriched by spending a few years, uh, even if you are a private sector guy, spending a few years doing a stint in public service and civic responsibility? I wonder if you could just speak to that. 
Well, thank you for your kind words, and I'm luckier than I should be. I'm just a, a simple guy from suburban Detroit who, who stumbled his way into a couple of interesting places along the way. I think there's a couple things. Number one, you know, to any young person thinking about their their you know coming out of school, what they want their plan, their you know, life to look like, definitely consider public service. And if you ever have the opportunity to serve even an internship, do it. Because the people you meet, it's the opportunity you'll get in life to meet people from across the country, around the world, people who are ambitious, smart, want to make a difference. And getting, you know, these are the relationships that you'll carry for life. You know, it, it's it's the folks that I met when I, you know, was in D.C. and and uh, that have gone on and grown up to, you know, through their, their own channels and their own interests to great things. But that network you build is so, so incredible and uh, and special. And the best way to get it is by serving. Uh, and it, you know, when you're when you're young, you can live in an apartment with and share an apartment with several people. You can cut your expenses. It's a lot harder to do later on in life when you may have a mortgage to pay and all that. So if you have the opportunity early on, whether it's in Washington, D.C., your capital, or in the armed forces, you know, please serve the country. I think it's it's an incredible opportunity, and, and, and I hope I have more opportunities to do it in my lifetime. The other piece of advice I would give is, and I learned along the way is, um, and has been helpful thus far, at least is, you know, work your way down the food chain, not up it. You know, find your way to, you know, it's a lot easier to, to, to start from the top and settle in where you're, uh, where you find your right home. And, you know, being bashful gets you nowhere. Don't be afraid to reach out to people. You don't necessarily have to go through the HR process. Be an HR ninja. Figure your way out into any organization, whether it's in government or business, because you'll eventually find the right spot for you. And, and uh, you know, it'll help you find your way later on when, you know, career paths aren't linear. So, you know, expect there to be kind of spikes and, and, and plateaus and spikes here and there and knowing how to navigate that early on and finding those opportunities, out those opportunities um, you know, should be beneficial to anybody entering the workforce. Yeah, terrific. Uh, great advice, John. Thanks so much. And, and, and appreciate uh, this last hour with you. I, we, again, we know you're busy. You've got a lot of things on your mind and uh, we cannot thank you enough for spending some time with us today and uh, best of luck to you and to the NYSE in the future. Well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for the work you're doing to uh, continue to advance not only the legacy, but the policies of, of one of our country's greatest presidents. Great, terrific. Take care, John. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do. <laughs>